What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Talk Trash, back on Fight Flow Overbooked with another rest uh, with another episode of Loving Wrestling. Today, I'm joined by the lovely Amanda Savage from Wrestle Talk. So, welcome to the show. Hi, I'm so excited. So, if we take this back, do you remember the moment that you not that you first discovered wrestling, but do you remember the moment that you were like, "Yeah, I like wrestling now. Wrestling's my thing." Yeah. Um. I was thinking about this last night quite a bit, trying to figure out, like, when did that really come together for me? And I think um, I think a little bit of it had to do with wanting to talk to boys in junior high, um, oh. because there was, like, it was sort of the height of that, um, not really, it's like the beginning of the Attitude Era, before stuff started, like, really picking up and going mainstream, but there was just a few kids in junior high who were, like, really into it. Um, and I'd watched it when I was young, so I remember getting extremely attached emotionally to I think when I really thought wow this is for me and I think I'll stick with this for a long time um I was really really attached to Mick Foley like Mm -hmm. mankind like the whole storyline around him winning a championship was something that meant so much to me as like a younger girl so um I think really also, the document or not documentary, sorry, the bio like autobiography started coming out around that time. Um, and mm. I remember after I read um like Have a Nice Day was later, so like 1999. But I remember being just like, oh, these people are real people. And then you're kind of attached on a different level where you're sort of like, um, that was the first time I started considering it at, from an artistic perspective. Mm. Like everything. I'm really big on everything as someone's job because it is in life. Like every piece of your life was touched by someone else professionally who's proud of what they did Um, from the packaging on your granola in the morning all the way into your pillowcase at night. Right. So um, I think having that autobiography series, I remember reading McFoley's and I I don't know if they were ghostwritten, like I'm not sure the details on them, but it had it felt very personal to me at the time. I think photos um, were all written by himself, definitely. I, think, I don't know about anyone yeah, else. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, there was a rock one. I remember there was a Kurt Angle one that I was really into. Um, it was just I think around that time was the first um time I started thinking of it as not just a, like a television program or a sport that I'm consuming, but more of um, positioning myself from the perspective of like someone's creating this this is someone's job this is someone's art this is someone's um mm. passion and their whole livelihood so um yeah I would say mankind a little little road to success story there really mm. when you start to get emotionally attached that was when I decided oh wow this is the fandom for me <laughs> mm. do you remember I know you talked about a wrestler there like Mick Foley, Mankind, whatever word you want to use. But do you remember the moment, the match that you were like, okay, I like what wrestling is about, not just the characters? I mean, not really. I don't think that, and I'm very, and I maybe shouldn't be so honest, but definitely for me, um, the actual matches, the actual wrestling kind of maybe comes like third um so I I I love storylines I love drama I love promos um I love shenanigans and hijinks um but the actual wrestling I can certainly appreciate um I can appreciate Mm. exceptional technical wrestling but I I don't know that I have any strong emotional connections before that like hell in a cell with mankind and undertaker that was and not even in those moments that's not still about the actual wrestling it was about that suspension of disbelief and kind Mm. of um getting really caught up in a moment like that so for Mm. me you know i don't know that i should publicly say that but the 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 wrestling itself is sometimes i don't have a lot of um the biggest moments for me or the most um impactful have usually come around a wrestling moment mm, i understand what yeah. you're saying completely there so what about when you have to watch wrestling for actually we'll do that second but for people that may not know how did you join wrestle talk etc and things like that yeah so i was a, a moderator for youtube for like about a year uh, it was something that I felt like I almost owed the channel because they, um, no one there knew, but it was such a big support for me when I was pregnant and I was ill. 
um, that when there was like a call for volunteer moderators, I felt like I owed them some time back because I had received so much support um, totally unknowingly from them. Mm. So um, I did that for about a year. And then they were just looking for if anyone had experience writing and writing has always been something that I loved, but wasn't doing professionally in any capacity um, and just sort of started there like hey do you want to do a trial and then from there I've, I've just stuck around so we're almost two years now um and I work I do the like basically live shows for the most part um, I have some other random writing shifts here and there but usually if there's a show going on um I'm writing the news from that and then yeah it's it's ended up about seven days a week because I throw some stories out on Sunday too so mm. um yeah it's been fun though so yeah. um, I'm pretty engaged in wrestling in that way. And I'm sort of like professionally compelled to watch a, a great deal of it um, weekly. And so, yeah. Mm. You talked about that being professionally compelled in your own words to watch wrestling in some ways. So who, maybe who do you like watching wrestling alongside when it isn't part of your professional work, for lack of a better word? And how do you keep your fandom alive when you do have to watch wrestling, in your own words, sometimes seven days a week? Yeah, so I think what's usually fun for me is because I'm on the West Coast, so I watch it on the East Coast feed, but it still hasn't aired where we live yet. So there's still a three hour ahead. Like I have seen the show usually, depending on what it is, like Ross, it ends right when it starts here for us. But um, so... There'll be times like on Saturday for Collision, I came out from writing um, and then Collision was about to start in Seattle. So I sat down and watched that FTR Bullet Club Gold match again, um, just as like for fun. I still haven't seen um, it, but I need to watch oh, it. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, no, it's good. And so I think that most of the time, if I'm watching wrestling it is my, you know, my husband's sort of passively there he's not the biggest wrestling fan but we're you know I'm not the biggest uh Zelda fan either but it's happening in my house and I'm supportive so mm. um he'll you know like he'll engage he'll check it out if there's something um but I think I can be a little because I have already seen the matches and just the way that kind of my brain works I can be I think I'm annoying to watch wrestling with to be fair because I'm like oh you have to look now there's going to be a really cool move you know like I, mm. I don't let him experience it perhaps um as much as I'm telling I'm, I'm doing my own at home commentating so um but yeah mm. I do re I'll rewatch matches that I think are were particularly um compelling or there's definitely times um, I would say that there are times, especially like an AEW pay-per-view, for instance, because Too of, long. whoa, they're long, but they're also, because I'm so like focused on what I'm doing, I don't always feel like I watched the match mm. in the same way that I would if I was watching it just to enjoy it versus watching it for like. I'm watching it while I'm writing, trying to figure out like where the story's going. So I'm also not wasting my time. You know, it's like kind of a, it's a confusing balance, but there's definitely plenty of moments I've gone back to circle back to. And I think that helps keep my fandom alive in a way because it's still, I still make a little bit of space to engage mm -hmm. for fun. Um, but yeah, I do I, like if I have a day off, I'll try to forget about it. Even on 4th of July, I asked for the day off. Um, so I could go to a barbecue and I tried to forget about it. And then around like 5.30, I was like, oh, I wonder how that uh, loser leaves NXT match is going. Oh, you know, like no. I wanted to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to know what was going on with Diamond Mine and the schism instead of what I was doing. So it definitely, I still have, I think I still have a healthy enough passion for it, which is nice. Mm. What about watching wrestling with your children? And I'm asking about the anarchy in the arena moment. Yes. That, that always makes me laugh when we talk about that. I'm not going to lie. It makes me laugh too. The blood and guts is coming up. We'll see how much they get to see. Oh, they, yeah. um, a new development is that my daughter has a um, Cody Rhodes plush that I got. I got her when we went to Raw. And um, so she puts her binkies under it. So she's at this age where we're trying to phase out the binky. So we're mm. like, okay, it's for overnights only, or it's when you're sleeping only. So instead of getting, um, yeah. So I don't know how much, I don't know what she thinks Cody Rhodes is. 
Um, but I'm pretty sure she understands because both of the kids will love a good entrance and then they kind of meander away. Like they don't care as much after someone comes out, there's pyro and there's a song and there's dancing and then they like kind of mosey away. But she, she reports to Cody. So she gives her binky when she gets up, she gives it to the doll. She puts the binkies under Cody. And then at night, um, I've fully heard my husband when I'm in here writing, I've, I've heard him say to her, go get your binky from Cody. (laughs) And she goes, and goes to her bed so it's it's pretty wild they um yeah we'll we'll see how this evolves as they grow up because it's certainly like with her she she was was pregnant with her when I started this job so she's never known mom as a social worker like my son Mm. he he thinks mom's going to the hospital still sometimes I think um I mean he knows I sit in here so but you know with COVID there was a time that you were working from home a little bit so um, I'm not sure if he realizes mom goes to watch TV and type about it, but I do think that my daughter um, understands there's a connection for sure. Mm. The thing with the anarchy in the arena story. Oh, yes. Makes me yeah. Laugh, is like, did, you have to... was it the can? Was it the Eddie Kingston word it? Yeah, it was. So you should go to Tom Tuck's Rubbish his YouTube channel to hear that whole conversation. But there is um, my, I was really excited um, doing like writing news during Anarchy in the Arena. I remember being very, very enthusiastic about it, um, kind of to the detriment of everything around me. I didn't really pay that close of attention. By the time I looked up, um, it was, my husband had already taken my son out of the room Um, they were like getting a whole different child area set up in a different room because they like he decided we're not all consuming this media together anymore and um, as Eddie came back out with like the gasoline can and like looked so just like a right moment out of Grand Theft Auto is is always the thing I think I think it's like Trevor from Grand Theft Auto um so yeah, I, as I was marking out, like fully, like, oh my God, like clapping like a seal. Um, my husband had the baby and I rem- I'll never forget the look on his face. He's like, no, like, <laughs> like turned her head and I, like, went in a different room. It was just like, oh dear. Okay. Yeah, I guess we gotta. So yeah, that's when I CPS, started. CPS, CPS. <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, I have plenty of social work friends um, that are still in the field. And I've had that conversation with them before about <laughs> not, is it okay? But just like, what would you guys say if you had to go do an assessment on that? Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, oh, they don't watch very much of it. It just makes me laugh every time. They certainly, <laughs> they certainly are um, into some entrances though. That's very cool. If they so, hear the whoa, they come running. <laughs> oh yeah i'm not gonna do what i did last time because that got in my head after two days and i don't <laughs> want to do that again but anyway what you do if like obviously because you can tell how passionate you are about wrestling and stuff like that currently if you ever had what do you do on days that you're like okay i've worked 13 days straight or something i'm not passionate about wrestling like this is just watching a match how do you keep yourself motivated to love wrestling and have you ever given any thought to what you would do like for wrestle talk and stuff if you did stop loving wrestling? I mean, I think what's hard is that I loved being a social worker and I really loved um, what that meant and what you could contribute to folks' lives. But mm. that was something that had such a high level of burnout, right? And like compassion fatigue, something that we don't always talk a lot about is moral injury. Um, that when you're working at working in within an institution, um, mm-hmm. you're not always able to actually support people the way that makes logical sense. You're just sort of upholding the institution and their policies and procedures. So um, saying already having walked away from something that I felt like I loved and was passionate about and had watched change underneath me and not felt comfortable with anymore. Um, I have thought about that before of like, what does this look like for wrestling? Um, I think that came up around the time there was that big rumor that Saudi Arabia, like the kingdom of Saudi Arabia could be purchasing WWE and kind of like, what does this feel like to me? And, and how much, um, how comfortable would I be, you know, just kind of having different um, 
ethical or moral questions around what wrestling is or what it means. Um, I think it would have to be pretty significant for me to just like give up. But I do think what's nice about, um, I think what's nice about, Sorry. I think what's, no, you're fine. Um, let's see. I lost my train of thought. I th you said, I think what's nice about, and then. I know. I, I think so many things are nice. Oh. I think what's, <laughs> I think what's nice though about wrestling is that it can still stay an escape, even if mm. you're not. Um, So the times that I maybe, maybe if I'm a little burnt out of AEW, there's still WWE. If there is, um, if I'm burnt out of WWE, there's AEW. I think usually the, my favorite, um, I think today, like Tuesday is one of my favorite days of the week. Cause I really love NXT. I'll be honest it's, <laughs> as we're recording this. Cause I don't know when this will air. I just tell, I just give it to the fightful people when they do that. Yeah, you know take care I mean? of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, I fully get what you're saying about different products and stuff. So do you believe you'd be, rather than being burned out on wrestling as a whole, do you believe you might be burned out on, say, one promotion and then you might just go, I'll watch some AEW to keep the fandom, if that makes any sense? I think the main thing that keeps it interesting for me is that it does, everything is changing so quickly and there is kind of two sides to focus on, right? So you can invest a lot of energy in backstage happenings and the news and the stuff that I'm sort of like, again, professionally compelled to know about. But then there's also this other whole delightful world that maybe isn't always newsworthy, but that is kind of um, more fun and I feel like that is what helps me um, stay engaged as well like it probably sounds weird but I have like the counter um, experience of social media or Twitter like because I felt that before I did this job I didn't know I was not on any kind of wrestling social media at all so I didn't know anything about the wrestlers personalities or like behind the scenes type I didn't have any mm. praxis of that um, at all so beyond like perhaps a couple people on Instagram but other than that not really and so something that's been kind of fun is that um, it's nice to see people's personalities and it's kind of fun to just hop on Twitter and like see two or three really nice things like happy things and then just run away again yeah. so that's one of my favorite things to do is like if there's a downtime with the kids or if there's just like you know I'm waiting at Starbucks or something I'll just like look and a lot of times I think it that has helped me have a deeper appreciation for folks in ring work as well because there's just you have such a everyone's like multifaceted multi-dimensional so it's cool to be able to see that aspect so even if I think on-screen product is not my favorite I still always feel pretty passionate about um being supportive to the humans that created that art mm. um sometimes to my detriment because I get I get my hands slapped a little bit for being um perhaps overly complimentary or like overly positive but I do think at the end of the day they're all doing something that I have no ability to do. Like my dream, like little gonzo journalism dream is to have someone um, let me just try to get in a ring. Ooh. I think it's hard. Like, yeah. I think we, oh, I think we underestimate, like, I would love to see. Yeah. I would just, I, and especially in some of these big, um, my wedding heels were Louboutins and they were, I think five inches. Like they were, big oh, wow. um and I so I've seen like I've seen Charlotte I've seen Selena Vega I've seen them get in that ring in red bottoms and I don't know how because those red bottoms are slick too that's like the mm. point there, there's not <laughs> so yeah. I don't know I just think someone I, I think just just getting in the ring not even an entrance but if you go through what that is like any one of us how comfortable would we be getting out in front of 20,000 people on our underpants and climbing and looking cool. Oh, that's a mm. lot. I think so. I the least Batista I can do is be respectful. To the ring personally. You know, Batista at WrestleMania 35, I think that would happen to me. Like <laughs> where he fell into the ring. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think that would happen to me. So I would like what? to see a crowd of jobbers carrying you. 
they would they can yes. hear you like on a a platform what was that like triple Aladdin. h entrance Aladdin. that had the yeah 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 oh yeah absolutely i'd like to okay. see that no we can't rest until that happens Stop. that's gotta happen right we're we'll so, making it happen or up there uh not having much social media before you joined wrestle talk was that a requirement to get like was you said oh was you told by say i think it's social media abby for example that works for wrestle talk we would like you to have a twitter account was you told anything like that yeah so i tried to swerve twitter like i tried to tell them just let me know if someone says something to me um but because i was scared of like that aspect of it um but really it is extremely helpful in finding stories and staying engaged in like the actual news of what's going on so my the my actual twitter account started where they um my editor gave me a list of people that i needed to follow um because it was like the news website you know things that like these people you need to follow and mm. then if you add people from there you know that's kind of your own prerogative but i definitely got instructed um I, no one at any point has instructed me to be chatty on twitter that is all me um i don't know like during the shows no one's telling me to do it but just sometimes i get really excited that might have been a bit too um, inside baseball and i wasn't sure if you could answer that question no it's okay i i mean i um i really love all of my colleagues and i think they are all absolute gems um I don't ever think, I truly don't ever think anything is like mean spirited. I think everything is always for everyone to grow and to be better. So, um, yeah, I won't say his name, but I, I wonder sometimes if he would prefer that I not be chatty on Twitter, but I don't think I've done anything damaging to the brand. No. Um, but yeah, no, like I, I can't keep things to myself. Like I really, I just, so, uh, Ty Mello is like looking for a baby stroller and like I, I couldn't keep my stroller review to myself like I, I am a little bit embarrassing like I will at wrestlers every now and again if it's like <laughs> because you know had a hot stroller recommendation she needed to know these things I've done that for interviews so I cannot comment you know what I mean? <laughs> so you brought up there having appreciation for all of your wrestler talk colleagues and things like that so in your opinion and i won't disqualify wrestle talk but i won't say you can say five wrestle talk people who are right. five people in the social in the wrestling media currently that you're like yeah they deserve their flowers they're good at what they do etc yeah i will say that i still basically start every day watching the wrestle talk news video despite the fact that sometimes i feel like Oh yeah, I, I wrote that last night. Oh, I wrote that. You know what I mean? Because there's only so many things that are happening. Mm. It's not like I, I'm not writing the copy for their script at all, but it's just, um, it's almost like a check for me where I go like, okay, yeah, I knew that. I knew that. It's, yeah, like, yeah, it's yeah. kind of strange. Um, but I still, I still very much enjoy Russell Talk. Outside of that though, um, I think it's, I think it's cool anytime that anyone has the opportunity to like shine a spotlight on other female creators. Mm. And there are so, um, there are so many folks that you probably don't know their names. Like I probably don't know their names, but that they all work really hard. Um, so there's that, but folks that like, you know, we know their names, right? Like the ones that have a kind of a social media presence or that someone might know. Um, I really enjoy Kylie and Haley from Fightful. I think that their mm -hmm. work is really fun. Um, I love their voice. They both have this like very unique presence that is missed when it's not there. Um, I always love Somali Bell. Um, I love her writing. I love how positive she can be. Um, I also like, um, I won't butcher their names, but like Rest Friends, that YouTube channel. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I I have a complicated last name now, so I know people say it wrong all the time. So I hate being disrespectful, but, but I won't even try. Um, but both of those gals are wonderful and fun and kind of just have um, a fresh perspective um, how else? I just said ladies tonight. Um, I mean, yeah, I, there's, what else do I, oh, you know who I think is bringing a nice voice is, um, what's his last name? 
You know Cam's last name? No. Yeah. Like Seahawk Cam. Oh, <laughs> Is it right, Hawkins? Right, right. See, I'm not too sure, but Seahawk. I do I know. Know yeah, 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 yeah. I um, but he's done a couple really wonderful, um, like features that are more something that I would love to do in the future. Like that is that is the ultimate goal, in my opinion, is to be able to chat with wrestlers about their lives, not so much, um, like mm. I I probably should never say this, but like I don't necessarily care about a a little like a dirt sheet scoop. I I want to hear those more compelling stories about where you're your background and where you come from and what, why do you do this? And kind of all of the questions that I feel like you ask folks in media are things that I would love to know a lot of the times from the wrestlers themselves. So um, some of his stuff for the ringer has been just like really cool. His mm -hmm. Danielson feature was great. Um, yeah. There's, there's been a bunch. The sting was cool. So, yeah. That's very cool. Um, as we look at wrapping this up, because I do want to be respectful of your time, Amanda. The question that I end this show on is, do you believe you will always be a wrestling player? I think in some capacity, because I think so many of the memories now are like intrinsically linked with not just being a child. Like it is for me a lot about um, nostalgia from when I was young. Mm. I just um, realized I missed the question out before we did the end Oh question. no, yeah, you're okay. Sorry. It's okay. You want to so, go back? No, okay, go back. We'll go back. So, um, what I, as we look at wrapping this up, before we do, I uh, about you loving wrestling. What are three moments from the past that you love from wrestling, and then three from the current product as we record this in July 2023 that you're like, yeah, I like that. That's fun. Current stuff. Um, I'm still very invested in this bloodline thing and how this all settles out. We have not yet to see the conclusion, if any, at SummerSlam. So that's fascinating. Um, I genuinely love NXT. I think that they're, I, I just feel probably overly attached to most of them. They're very young. They're just like living their dreams right anyone who is 21 and chasing what they want to do for the rest of their life at that high of a level i think that's the coolest thing so um so many of them i'm really impressed by but um mount rushmore let's do it core jade tiffany stratton um roxanne perez thea hale i believe that's the future um what else who else do i like currently let's say an AEW thing um there's so many you know the perhaps my favorite thing about wrestling now overall is that there are so many um there are so many different types of females represented mm. so I think what was kind of not strange but was just like a function of the time was that when I was maybe getting into my fandom at that age um you were like you were a sable girl or you were a china girl right like there wasn't a whole lot of um you know then there was like luna and like things started progressing from there but but for a while there kind of was these two archetypes for females it was sort of mm -hmm. like a a frightening monster gal and like sexy lady um so now i think it's really really cool that there's all of that on a spectrum so you're still you still have people who are beautiful and mean and um, that's okay because that I still, the, my favorite character currently is Chelsea green. Mm. Um, that to me is the perfect character. That's so funny. It's so annoying. It's just like, if someone can't stand that type of personality, they cannot stand Chelsea green. And then there's others of us who are like maybe a little more on the annoying side in real life. And we're like, Oh no, she's great. What do you mean? You know? So it's kind of that being able to subvert um, expectation in that way is really, really neat as a female um, performer. I imagine that that's, that's really cool. So you've, you've got Rhea Ripley, but you're also able to be Julia Hart. They're a spectrum, yeah, yeah, yeah. but there's different vibes and there's kind of something for everyone. I think it's really cool that my daughter can like look up to Athena and Ruby Soho. And, you know, there's a whole different range of what being a woman is now. So currently every woman is my favorite. 
Mm. <laughs> Moments from history. I'll make it snappy. Um, I can chat your ear off all day. Um, uh, well, we always do when we're together. That's the fun <laughs> thing. I like hanging out, Tom. Um, let's see. Moments that probably things that like live in my mind that will like stick with my fandom for quite some time. I mean, I always am just banging on the same drum of Hell in a Cell. Um, but that that Mankind Undertaker Hell in a Cell is still the most um, frightened I've been. But, you know, okay, um, that same moment, that same feeling, I got it again with the uh, Will Ospreay and Kenny with the Tiger Driver. Oh, oh, oh. I just got it again. What did they just do? I think it was... It was something that was just on dynamite. No, it was collision. I'll have to think of it honestly, but something on collision was popping me in the same way where I was scared. Like I my like we have um some little walkie-talkies um mm. because for a while I was getting like really into things and then my kids and husband would be worried I was like something was going on with me in here. So they'd get scared and then my husband would run down here and there was nothing wrong. I was just like, oh my God, Nick Jackson. So like <laughs> it's, yeah. so yeah, but that any moment that makes you feel um, that suspension of disbelief, disbelief and kind of like what is real and but also um, I am a kind of an anxious person by nature. So I get very uh, I get worked. I mean, still to this day, I get worked. I get scared. You know what it was? It was still it was the FTR and Bull Club Gold. It was uh, when um, Dax and Jay White went over that barricade. Oh, I've seen that. Yeah. I've and seen it that. was like the part that disturbed me and the part that got me like is it real oh no are they okay and like started to really work me was that i felt that um cash wheeler's response was too genuine like i felt like cash was scared for his friend and like the way that he tried to push the barricade open to get to them made me so anxious because that felt like oh wow that's this is someone who's concerned about their friends so whether that was like a fun detail of complete acting or if he actually was nervous about how that spot went i will never well maybe we'll know but um yeah currently like did i do three current things already no i already did the current the historical what's yours tom does anyone ever ask you these questions they never have but i'll do mine very quickly i'm gonna yes ask someone to flip the script on me for an episode of this but just current, I'll do current. I won't do historical. I'll say that okay. for another episode. Uh, currently, I'm loving the blood and gut stuff. I'm not going to lie. Mm. Collision mm -hmm. as an overall show. Sorry, <sighs> but I think it's better than Dynamite as an overall show. Personally, you know. Personally, yeah. for my wrestling taste, as an overall show, it's a better overall show. And this might be controversial again, but... CM Punk being back in wrestling is just good for wrestling. I hate to say it, but it is. Yeah, that's those are good takes. Those are solid current things to be excited about. And mm. you know the thing, let, let me go on a CM Punk tangent. Yeah, yeah. Briefly. The main thing that I think that I've started to fully process just within the last week is I don't think um, I think the magic and the beauty of CM Punk is that he is very much um, whatever you project onto him. Mm. So he is kind of that almost therapeutic blank screen. Um, and that's something that when you're being trained to be a therapist, depends on what orientation you're going with. But they, um, one style would be that you're kind of um, that blank screen so that folks are having these experiences in life and they're projecting their strong feelings and strong emotions on to you as a therapist as like a blank screen central figure I think CM Punk serves a bl as a blank screen figure for a lot of people because if they feel that um, depending on how they read or the situation or how they believe or what they really think um, you know you get such strong dichotomous opinions about him that I feel like it has a lot more to do with the opinion holder than perhaps Phil Brooks himself um for all of us that don't personally know him I mean I can't speak for anyone who actually personally knows him or may or may not have feel felt victimized by him right like I, you can't yeah, speak for anyone who's had that, that. experience yeah um, but for the vast majority of us who really have no skin in the game, 
Um, and it's very confusing to me how people have like the most strong opinions and are very, very passionate because I think I can like see, I can see both sides of it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think I, I think I've processed that this week. I think it's a lot of projection. So hmm. I wonder how CM Punk brings up so many emotions in people. You brought up emotions there. And to wrap this up, the question I end this on is, do you think you will always love wrestling, Amanda? I do. I do. I can't see. Um, can't think of a time that hearing that stone cold glass break doesn't just like bring some joy to my heart. Um I love to listen to wrestling themes in the car. This morning I was <laughs> at the grocery store at 5 a.m. and I was definitely having um, a full bloodline. Situ- that was a full oh, bloodline wow. playlist on the way to the grocery store. Usos first, Solo Sokoa second. Then you get the Roman Reigns as you're entering the parking lot of the grocery store. You just feel so That's triumphant. Very cool. You're just like the best mom of life going to get your cinnamon brioche at 5 15 in the morning. Um, yeah. So I think it's it's stuck with me. I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't know that I'm in now with the absence of total divas. I don't think oh, yeah, that yeah. if I, because that was really like, that is, there's a good decade in the middle that I don't think I follow or care that much, but I care deeply about the Garcia twins. I care mm. deeply about Trinity. I dare, or I care deeply about Natty. Like those are still emotional investments that, Every time I'm sitting around writing a gratuitous Trinity article, it is because I love Total Divas and I still just want to see all of them succeed. And she's a gem and deserves all the good things in the world. But without um, that kind of reality show through line that kind of kept my fandom going when a a time that was just sort of through mainstream interactions. um, Yeah, I think I'd still probably be poking around seeing what dan housen's doing mm. all that good stuff mm. that's very cool so as we wrap this up where can the good people find you your rest talk content etc oh yeah you can go to russeltalk.com um and yeah so pretty much seven days a week there's something i wrote on there but if i didn't write it some other really lovely great person who's super smart and cool did um there's also, I suppose, there's still Twitter is still a thing as of July. So mm-hmm. um, it's underscore Amanda Savage. Um, I've been, I got like a little, what is, I don't know if it's Ko-Fi or Ko, like, I don't know what that I'm is. But sure um, that seemed to me like a really um, basic way to blog, like a, a sort of, I'm not very technologically savvy, um, but I do have like a lot of things in my head that don't go for, like, that are not nobody on Russell talk needs to deal with that but um i might have some kind of thoughts floating around at some point i think there's so many parallels in mental health and the storylines we see on wrestling that mm. um yeah i'd love to pull that together and synergize that in some way to be approachable but we'll see to be that's continued very, tom that's very cool as you say to be continued if you and i don't connect at least once a year i'll be very surprised oh it? i know Oh my gosh. I love Tom. Tom is the best. Tom has such good energy. Tom has also given me just like such good inspirational vibes. I think that, I mean, that's something that, where did I see? Did somebody talk to you? Were you interviewed? That Does your family have like a passion, sign? Passion Universe thingy. I was on Passion Universe recently, which was a podcast. I'm not sure. Do you have like, does your family have like a sign in your house that says something to the effect oh, no. of? Right. That was on the spotlight. I know what you're talking about. Was it? It was. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Jensen asked me, like, how are you able to get so many great interviews? Like, for example, I got the Jimmy Van one from Fight For, and mm-hmm. he never does any. And I was like, yeah. We have a sign on my door which basically says, if you don't ask, you don't get. So I have yeah. always asked. Do you know what I mean? Hundred percent. Yeah. So now I've adopted that. So I have made it more vulgar though, um, because one of my best friends' husband, he is like one of the most successful people I know, and his favorite thing used to be to say, "F it, why not?" Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, just the more vulgar version of, but also just like, why not? Why not me? Right? I can ask. Yeah. The worst thing that happens is someone says no. 
best thing that happens is we get to hang out with Tom and chat on a podcast again. But it's always fun chatting with you. So as we wrap this up, uh, I've asked you where we can find you. Mm -hmm. But as we wrap this up, guys, make sure you like, share and subscribe to Fightful Overbooked on YouTube. Follow Fightful Overbooked on Fightful on Twitter and all their social medias. You can subscribe to my channel, uh, Tom Talks Rarish, where in I interview some of the greats in wrestling media about their overall fandom and creative process. Amanda's been on there before, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter, at Tom Talks Rarish, and I will see you in the next episode of Loving Wrestling. Goodbye now.